Now, Joel, the story of the flood is our textbook example of source criticism. It's literally it's your textbook example, example, John. It is indeed. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, this is one of those stories that uh, almost from the very beginning of critical scholarship, people recognized was uh, just ripe for this kind of analysis. And the reason here uh, especially is the flood story may be famous, and we could all sort of tell it, and we all know the kids' songs that go with it, uh, and it's made into children's books and stories, which is a little bit confusing considering how many people die in it. But uh, it's such a familiar story, and yet if you pick up the Bible and try to read it through, and try to especially to sort of plot out what happened when, you run into problems pretty quickly. I mean, the story begins with God mm -hmm. saying to Noah, I'm going to bring a flood, and I need you to take two of every single animal, right, male and female, famously, uh, onto the ark with you. And it says, and Noah did so. The very next thing that happens is God says to Noah, I'm going to bring a flood. You need to bring seven pairs of every clean animal and bird and one pair of every unclean animal. And it says, and Noah did so. So now either he went on two trips to collect animals mm -hmm. or he collected far more than we think. I mean, in any case, Maybe he had actually had eight pairs. Or, or at yes. least two pairs of everything. The prob point is, there's a conflict and a, a repetition and a contradiction right from the beginning. Yeah. And, and that sort of thing continues through. There's a chronological question. How many days did the flood last? The yeah. song says it lasted for 40 daisies, daisies. But we, uh, you read it, and it's clear that it lasts for a year. Right? The waters rise for 150 days, yes. and yeah. then they recede for 150 days. And there's a calendar that goes with it to tell us the 40 days thing doesn't fit into any of this. What bird does Noah send off? Does he send off uh, a dove or mm -hmm. a raven? Turns out he does both, but he doesn't need to. Uh, how many times does God need to tell Noah that he's never going to bring a flood again? Because he does it twice. Where does the water come from? Does it rain a lot? Or is this the cosmic opening of the floodgates of heaven and the waters yeah. of the deep beneath? Mm -hmm. If you read the story, you, there's no one answer to any of these questions, right? There's two answers yeah. to but each But actually, of them. the neat thing about the story is that you can separate the two answers. You can separate you can, them you, perfectly. You two perfect, coherent stories. That's and right. at least in this case, we can say that somebody went along with two copies and decided to put one paragraph here and then take another paragraph from the other one That's right. and back and forth like this. People have questioned whether people could do that you know, in days when you couldn't open two screens in your computer. Right, before well, cut and paste. Yeah, and you know, it must have been, in fact, a fairly cumbrous thing to do, but there's no doubt that they did it. Right, this is, this this is, is one the, of the cases the where there's just yeah. no doubt. Uh, yeah. Because when you separate these two stories, they are just each so good, and they're different. Uh, they're not the same story, but they have uh, the same general outlines, the same characters, Noah, a flood, an ark, some animals, yeah. death, and then the end. Now, it is also a little bit odd to have a flood in an Israelite story at all. Yeah, it's hard, uh, it, it's we, hard to We may to call imagine. it an Israelite story. There's no doubt that it's uh, written in the Israelite Judean tradition somewhere or other. Right. And why a flood? Right. Why, it, what, it, what, the, I mean, the answer idea. is it could, it could hardly have originated. It wasn't the Dead Sea that rose. No, it could hardly have originated yeah. in Israel because if you look through the entire rest of the Bible, Nowhere else is the threat that the Israelites feel uh, afraid of excess of water. Right? True, yeah. Excess of water is never something that they are, right? it's always drought and famine and lack of rain. This is what God threatens them with. And of course, in this case too, we have a couple of famous tellings of a flood story in Mesopotamian literature. The one that came to light first of all was in Gilgamesh. And when this came to light in the 19th century, it really bothered a lot of people. Yeah because you had somebody copying from the Bible <laughs> a thousand years before the Bible was written. Yes, it was a and, logical uh, problem. Yeah, yeah. And then this is also one of the ones that keeps amateur archaeologists in business. Yeah. Every 10 years or so, somebody finds uh, uh, the ark on right. top of Mount Ararat or yeah. some such place. And that's yes. actually, the, the, there's a strong tradition about this, that when the, the flood subsided, it was way up in Turkey. Yes. <laughs> so, right. again, how all of that 
they, there must be centuries of traditions that went into mm -hmm. this before these stories. Sure. And, and, and beyond that, we, you know, we know that the flood story as a tradition is a worldwide one. Right? Yeah. There are cultures all over the world that have flood traditions uh, from the Near East yeah. and, and, and everywhere else which many people, again, in that amateur archaeologist uh, sense, have tried to find evidence for that worldwide flood that accounts for all or, of these stories yeah. emerging. I would think it's, you know, there are maybe two classic things that people fear, water and fire. Mm -hmm. And eventually you'll get the, these, the, the idea that God destroyed the world once by flood and will do so in the future by fire. We'll come back to that one because of the question of whether God should be thinking of destroying the world yeah. again or not. But the Mesopotamian stories that are probably the ones nearest at hand for this. Now in Atrahasis, there's a very nice logic to it. And the problem is population control. Mm -hmm. No need to command people to increase and multiply and fill the earth. Right. So uh, you've got too many kids, so they try, you have a process of trial and error. And you sort of bring a plague, and then when that doesn't work, eventually you work up to a flood. Now, uh, in the biblical stories, what's the logic for it? In the biblical stories, the priestly and the Yahwistic accounts agree here on, on why the flood comes. And it's because humanity is wicked, right? Yeah. The Yahweh says this explicitly, right? All of mankind's thoughts are, uh, are wicked from, from, his, from his youth. This is the moralizing strand that's quite relentless. Yes, it may be. In the, in and, in, and in the priestly story, they say something similar, which is all flesh had corrupted its ways upon the earth, right? And there was a lot of violence, right? Hamas, yeah. lots of violence. Um, they say all flesh, which seems to suggest that it's humans and animals, right? Everybody yeah. seems to be killing each other, um, which we know is sort of the way of the world, uh, but not the way that necessarily had been envisioned originally it, it, in, in the priestly creation account. This actually brings up a point that we didn't get to mention when we were talking about Genesis 1. And that is, while, were people supposed to eat meat from the beginning? And not in Genesis 1. 1. In Genesis yeah. 1, they're not. They're supposed to really actually only be eating the fruit from the... Nope, that's the garden. In Genesis <laughs> 1, they're yeah. only supposed to be eating... Vegetables. They're only supposed to be eating vegetables. That's right. Yes, strict um, vegetarian diet. And the interesting thing is, were animals also supposed to be vegetarian? I don't think it actually says that. It doesn't but, uh, say it. It doesn't say it. But certainly by the time we get here, by the time we get to the flood, right. there's, if not meat eating, there's violence, right? Um, which, yeah. uh, you know, one requires the other at a certain point. Indeed, yeah. So yes, the, the rationale for both is humanity's wickedness. What's yeah. interesting, of course, in the structure of the story is, once the flood is over, humanity's just as wicked as it was before, and just yep. as violent as it was before. Yep. Right, the, it is, the flood didn't actually solve the problem. It's almost just more an exercise in release of uh, tension on God's part. <laughs> right? I have well, to do something, yes. yeah. but, but, but after the flood, there is a recognition that, in fact, this is the way it is. Now, that actually raises issues about the character of God mm. as God is portrayed in any of these stories. I, I usually like to highlight the passage at the beginning of the J account in uh, Genesis 6, 5. The Lord saw that the wickedness of humankind was great on the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made humankind on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. Now, this is, you read something like that in a Mesopotamian myth. It's normal. Mm. I mean, this is actually what happens. How the story gets going, in most cases, is that uh, gods create human beings on the earth, and they realize they've unleashed a monster, and you've got to do something or other to rein it in. Now, one of the stereotypes that people typically bring to the Bible is that God had it all planned out and it was intelligent design mm. from the beginning. Well, it's not so intelligent design in J, right. I think. Uh, th this is much more like what you get in Atrahasis of a God who makes it up as he goes along. Yes, it's very, and, it's very much a contradiction with yeah. what, you know, the statement sort of in Samuel, right? Is, is God like man that he should change his mind? Yeah. Well, the answer is 
Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. No question about it. Um, and how else would you think you got? Right. It, yeah. Right. Um, you know, if, if anything, looking around, if humans do anything wrong, that has to be a fault with design. You would think. To a certain extent. Yes, and in fact, they, they talk about the inclination of his heart. This is the Yetzer. Mm -hmm. And this is, there'd be great speculation on this in the later tradition of the inclinations right. that people were born with. Right. But these are about manufacturers' defects. That's right. right. So, and, and on top of that, God in this story, show, and not, the, not only here, has um, an anger management problem. Yeah, uh, itchy trigger finger. Yeah. Right, lots of, lots of ways to think about it. Yeah. It's very, it's problematic to a certain extent, right? The morality of destroying all living <laughs> things. Yes, if a human did this, we'd call them. Right, yeah. nothing good. Um, yeah. One of the interesting aspects uh, for me in the story is, is not why all humans are destroyed, because at the very least, you know, they do say, all flesh had corrupted yeah. its story, and all of humans' inclinations were bad. So there's some justification. But why the animals are destroyed uh, is, is to me an interesting question. And there are two different answers in the two different stories. Right? In the priestly story that says that all flesh had corrupted its way on the earth, okay, they, they're in trouble too. Right? They yep. have also been violent. Yep. Animals are eating animals and eating, eat, eating yep. humans. Um, Rabid dogs. Right. But in the Jay story, it's just the humans who have been wicked, so why do the animals have to go? It seems to me the answer is, in the J creation story, animals were created only for the purpose of accompanying and serving and being company yeah. for Adam. If there's no and need so for humans anymore, there's no need for any animals anymore animals either. Too. Now we should say a little bit about how it all comes out in the end. When the waters subside, mm -hmm. And, you know, in the Mesopotamian stories, when the gods get their sacrifices, they swarm like flies around them. Mm -hmm. uh, God in this, these stories likes his sacrifices, too. Yeah, the J story ends with sacrifice, yeah. uh, which is actually one of the a pro problematic when you read the story as a whole, because, of course, in theory, God has told Noah, bring him all uh, animals on board to save them. And, the and first, thing Noah does, yeah. first thing Noah does when he gets off is he kills a bunch of them. Now, if he'd only brought two of every kind, sacrifices would be impossible. But well, they may have been procreating like crazy while they were in the ark. Might have been. But, fast. but at least in the yeah. J story, it's specifically the clean animals, the sacrificable animals, animals that, that he brings seven pairs of. So he's, <laughs> so he's, of he's got his supplies yeah. uh, laid out for him. He gets off the yeah. ark and he offers a sacrifice and God smells the odor of the sacrifice and says, I'm never doing this again. As if in J, God's view of humanity is acceptance. They are who they are. They're evil. But they do do this thing for me that no other creature on earth can do, which is offer sacrifices. Yeah. So that, which is very much in the Mesopotamian tradition. The priestly story does not have sacrifices. The priestly story is the one that has the rainbow. Yeah. Right? And this is supposed to reassure us that the world will never be destroyed again. But now, if you read on in the Bible, even in the Hebrew Bible, and all the more so in the New Testament, you find the world is going to be destroyed again. <laughs> is God going to go back on this uh, promise to Noah later on? Or? Destroyed, but well, not, by not by water. Not by water, Not by water, yes. Right, and the, the rainbow, the, ra the rainbow, <laughs> yeah. rainbow is not necessarily an assurance for the people, it's also a reminder for God. When it yeah. starts to rain, that rainbow comes out, and God thinks, right, I gotta turn the rain off. Yep. That's, uh, that's really there, what's there going are on good there. signs uh, with current trends. The signs are that that is going to be fulfilled. Mm -hmm. That if anything, its drought is going to be the problem rather than uh, than excessive rain. It made an awful lot of sense in Israel, I would think, mm -hmm. uh, to say that God is not going to flood the earth again. Yeah. Now, and all the people that's required, then more particularly in the priestly strand, I guess, is not to eat animals with their blood. Right. So there's some restraining factor in it. That's right. But, it, this, but this is akin to, uh, you know, when you forbid something entirely, as we actually have talked yeah. about already, the temptation to do it is all the greater. But when you have controls in, so this is sort of like state control of, yeah. of violence, right? We are going to allow you violence within certain limitations. You can get it out of your system. You can eat the meat. But, uh, but it's now sort of limited. 
Yeah, but human nature being what it is, people will still go for rare steaks. I do.